Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out. For those of you here live and for those Zoomers at home, thank you for attending. My name is Janet Doberly. I am the media manager at Downtown Greens. I am here today with M Ford. They are our garden coordinator. I always want to make sure to give you the right title. Uh, and we are here today to talk about a few things. Em is going to come up and they're going to talk about what's happening in the garden now, what we're working on. Um, and then we're going to switch it over to talk about what people at home can do to grow some food, what they can do right now today to get their best vegetable garden for this season and seasons to come. So without further ado, I would like to give it up to Em Ford. I know everybody at home is clapping. Clap, clap, clap. Uh, hi there, I'm Ed Ford. I'm the garden coordinator at Downtown Greens. I feel like I want to be closer to that. It's holding me over. Uh, I haven't been with Downtown Greens for too long. Uh, it's been today's my two month anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Realize it's the time. So I kind of feel like a new guy in town. Uh, for the first two years that I've been in Fredericksburg, I actually worked up in Nova. So I feel very new to Fredericksburg, even though I've been here for two years. So I still like to kind of introduce myself. Hi, I'm Em. I'm an environmental scientist. I studied down in South Florida, in Broward County. I worked down there. That's where I got kind of my feet for like being in the public and working with the public. Um, I had a fabulous little uh, role as a garden specialist up in Meadowlark Botanical Garden, where I learned a whole heck of a lot about ornamental gardening and essentially uh, nothing that had to do with my degree, which was all environmental science. <laughs> uh, but it was a really, really cool thing to learn about. Um, I had studied natural areas, native plants, all that good stuff, native landscapes, uh, but never really got into ornamental. I was always a butterfly gardener or you know, fighting to save the ecosystem and ripping invasive plants out of there, you know, best I could. So it was a huge shift. So now with my position at Downtown Greens, I'm hoping to bring some cohesive, did we realize cohesivity, cohesiveness <laughs> to uh, the garden beds is my main goal. So what have I been working on? If you have been to the upper or lower garden recently, I have been, <laughs> I've been making my uh, mark known. That's my goal at least. I hope to put um, native plants in the beds. That's my biggest thing is I have been with a fervor and a passion, ripping out invasive plants, doing the absolute most uh, to make the garden accessible as well. You'll see my fabulous little pathway around the garden bed. I'm quite proud of that. Uh, it took my partner and I hauling a lot, a lot of mulch up and down a hill to mulch that path. So um, it's a, it was a huge achievement. Um, this bed actually down here now is not full of invasive ditch lily anymore, which is incredibly exciting. Uh, my fantastic group of volunteers. I wasn't ready to put anything in that bed just yet, but I asked them to fit it out a little bit and they just went for it. And I was like, you know what? Okay, get, get it out of there. It's invasive anyways. Uh, so we have been starting to put native plants in that bed now, which is just wholly so incredibly exciting. Um, I'm also attempting some point way, way in the future when, you know, maybe we get to a point zero to start moving on to one, two, and three. Uh, I hope to be able to label plants in the garden. I hope to tell people what everything is, maybe without being there. Uh, we hope to maybe introduce QR codes, something that you can scan with your phone to figure out what it is. Uh, a lot of people, when you're gardening, they walk by and they're like, oh, what's that? Or you want to do that at my house? <laughs> I always want to attempt to offer someone that resource that they can take home with them. That's my favorite thing is provide a space for learning and knowledge and for also the uh, native environment to be healthy and for everything to have its environmental function. That's, that's been my favorite word so far, environmental function. Ah, speaking of invasive plants, 
Look at the beautiful bouquet. Uh, Janet and I were actually walking around and I thought to myself, all of the invasive plants are blooming right now. Um, I should make a post about it or I should have Janet make a post about it because I'm not great at social media. Um, but I'm really great at taking pictures, I think. So currently and so excited about this. This is actually a very recent update as of Friday. We have our very first invasive plant management intern uh, from a, thank you, yes, Janet's silently clapping. Um, we have our very first invasive plant management intern. They will predominantly be working side by side with me. Uh, we also have a specialized volunteer now who comes in just to do invasive plant management, which is really incredible. Um, so I am able to take a college student now under my wing, teach them the ropes, teach them how to properly identify and remove invasive plants. Um, and then to replace them with the native version of that plant. That's the most important part is that, and we'll talk about it in a second, but nature loves the void. So the moment you remove a plant, invasive or otherwise, something's gonna take its place and it's most likely, unfortunately, gonna be an invasive plant. So with a sort of, uh, and you'll see another picture in the next slide as well, uh, one of the big things that I'm really working on is kind of a like rewilding movement. Um, so this plant, I actually took a picture of this plant on Daffodil Hill, if you've ever driven past uh, coming in from like Chatham, I think, or the Falmouth area, um, you'll see Daffodil Hill in April or whatever, Daffodil's bloom, not my favorite flower. <laughs> um, you'll see Daffodil Hill it looks awesome. Everything else is kind of dead and decrepit around it. And then, you know, wow, daffodils. Uh, if you were to walk down Daffodil Hill, it took me 25 minutes to find one native plant on Daffodil Hill, uh, which was heartbreaking. So my whole thing is to, A, make the garden more accessible, have our composting system set up. I have a really cool uh, picture to show you of my super dream compost system, um, working on converting Daffodil Hill into essentially a mini summer meadow. So I totally love the fact that everyone loves Daffodil Hill. We get a lot of feedback on it. Everybody says, oh, how gorgeous. So since daffodils do bloom early summer, or early spring, excuse me, I hope to convert it into a bit of a, a mini summer meadow so that everyone can still enjoy their daffodils in spring. Um, invasive plant management intern, got one. So amazing, so excited about that. Uh, and I'm also really trying to seek out volunteers. So we have our volunteer hours on Thursdays and Saturdays. Um, not gonna preach about that right now. But what I kind of desperately want is maybe somebody to work with me on Monday or somebody to work with me on Tuesday to kind of just hang out, learn the ropes. Um, and anybody who maybe wants to feel like they can do a little bit more for downtown greens outside of volunteer hours. This is Daffodil Hill. Uh, sorry, don't mind the Bradford pear limb down. Hopefully we'll be able to remove that tree entirely one day. Um, this is the whole 100 and two feet, I believe, from kind of like side to side of this image where that entire expanse, I found one, one single um, native plant, native firm too. It was buried under a bunch of Japanese honeysuckle. It was heartbreaking. So this is the area that I hope to really, really, really revamp, revive. With urban rewilding, I almost hesitate to call it that. Uh, rewilding essentially entails that you kind of just let it go. Um, this will be a controlled rewilding, uh, which is a little, you know, contradicting. But if we are to manage this area because it is so overrun with invasives, unfortunately, this installation essentially that we could do of, I believe, around 300 plants is what I'm estimating. Um, we could maintain it, control it, get rid of the invasives, and install and aggressive essentially that's another goal is to install aggressive native plants that will beat out any invasives um, and also remove the like eight or nine bradford pear trees that are on uh the top here of that um, 
yeah, the, the goal is to rewild this area, a controlled rewilding with um, the hope that it will be able to sustain itself essentially. Yeah. Don't know my time, I'm not going to gauge my time. I know, three minutes. I know. I have found the most incredible compost system in the whole entire world. This is a fabulous little sneak peek of it down here. And if anybody is curious, I can give you the uh, link for this. I currently am dealing with our compost system in the upper garden. Our upper garden system was built several years ago. It was made out of pallets, which is awesome. We want to reduce reuse as much as possible. However, it is not built to last. I guess that is one of the points is that when you take organic compostable material, also known as untreated wood, and put it into a composting system, it is going to break down. Uh, this system here that I am hoping to use as a guidance for what I hope to build uh, for the upper garden, would I think it would just be an absolute game changer. Uh, I think we would be able to accept a lot more input from the community as well, rather than just kind of our uh, employees <laughs> putting in what we use. Um, I think, yeah, I think we'd be able to do a lot of really cool stuff with that. And my new favorite obsession is indigenous microorganisms. This gentleman on Instagram, his Instagram name is Marco is growing. Really great guy. Uh, we almost, almost had him here for a program that we were going to host. Uh, it was going to be four hours long though, and I don't think many people were super hyped about sitting for four hours. Um, However, he does a lot of really incredible work, essentially cultivating and harvesting indigenous microorganisms from your environment. So essentially stuff that is genetically, you know, made to do its thing there on your land. Um, and he uses some really incredible things. He uses the Jadam uh, method, which is a Korean method, very cool. I am hoping to implement some of his stuff. Uh, I have a volunteer uh, community service kid who is currently working on learning it and he's gonna build us our very first Jadam IMO3 uh, microorganism box using straw and grains and all that good stuff. I think that's it. Yeah, there's a really old picture of me and <laughs> we're gonna move on to Janet Cobberly. Um, we are super happy to have you at Downtown Greens. You are making a huge difference and we love it. And I'm glad your last slide ended on compost because we are about to switch things up. We're all still under the gardening umbrella, but now we're going to focus a little bit more on vegetable gardening and things that we can do at home with or without a yard to grow our own food. I am Janet Doberly. Like I said earlier, I've been at Downtown Greens a little over two years. I started one week before lockdown as a program coordinator. <laughs> and so within a week, I uh, couldn't do any programs, um, which was fine because then I got to focus all of my attention on our vegetable gardens and I changed them from education gardens into food production gardens. And we got to give away our first year, 1700 pounds of food to the uh, local community, Hazel Hill, mostly low income housing. Um, and we were really excited about that and that has taken off. Now we have the free fridge and all, all kinds of stuff. So I've been vegetable gardening at Downtown Greens for a little while. I don't do it as much anymore, but I still remember how. So without further ado, slide. We oh, are good at go. those slides. Uh, so I would like to start off by saying that there are a thousand different ways to successfully grow vegetables. I'm gonna say things and there might be people at home or people here, they're like, that's not how I do it. And that's totally fine. The way I do it might not work for some people. All in all, you just gotta keep trying. So here's how I recommend doing things. Uh, you can grow in the ground, you can grow in beds, you can grow in containers. A lot of things you can grow in any of these situations. There are certain plants like pumpkins and watermelons corn that you don't want to grow in containers. There's not going to be enough room for the juice and the fruit. If you've ever grown watermelon or seen it growing, it gets 20 some feet long. So even if it starts out in that pot, it's going straight out into your yard or your parking lot. Uh, so I would avoid growing those in containers. 
But the things you can grow in containers, lettuce, radish, carrots, peppers, tomatoes, herbs, greens, and a million other things that I could mention. Um, mint, that's circled, because if you don't know, you should always grow mint in a container. Mint will take over the world if we allow it to. So we've got to make sure to fight the good fight and keep the mint out of the ground because it will take over. Slide. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, the most important thing to know about vegetable gardening is your vegetable families. The reason you want to know that, meant one of the reasons you want to know that, is because when you plant a vegetable from a certain family in a certain spot, you don't want to plant a vegetable from that family in the same spot the next year. The reason being is that the vegetables in the same family, they all take the same types of nutrients so that soil will be drained of those nutrients. They all attract the same types of pests. So the pests the next year will be like, oh, I remember this spot, oh, great. And they'll come back. So you keep one of, you wanna switch it up every two years if you can. Give it two years before you plant vegetables from the same family in the same spot. I am not, oh, look, I messed that up. Shame, damn it. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to sit here and read out all the uh, vegetables in each family, but I do encourage you to look it up. Um, you are always welcome to contact Downtown Greens and we can make this whole presentation available to you if you'd like to read it at home. Um, but it's just really, I cannot stress enough, it's really important to learn your vegetable families if you want to grow vegetables. Oh, look at you. You're reading my mind. Um, <laughs> This chart, I'm not expecting anybody either here or at home to read this chart right now. It's just up for an example. The Virginia Cooperative Extension has created a wonderful chart that you can get online. Uh, they have a chart for every zone that is in Virginia. We are in zone 7A, which is the best zone because we get all four seasons and we have enough warmth to have two growing seasons every year. But it's not so hot that we have fire ants. If you've ever experienced fire ants, they're the devil. So I do recommend that you go to the Virginia Cooperative Extension. Look up this chart, even if you're not a chart person, because it does look a little intimidating. As soon as you see the key at the bottom, X means plant, zero means harvest. If you go by date, you can see exactly what you can plant right now and when it'll be ready to harvest. So if you go to the next slide, um, this is a list. We looked at the chart for you. As of this day, these are the things that can go ahead and be planted today or tomorrow if you're not going to go home and plant beans, cucumbers, eggplants, melons, okra, peppers, potatoes. Anything with an asterisk should have been started, or you can come to the co-op and buy some seedlings that were already started for you and put those in. If it doesn't have an asterisk, you can just put that seed directly in the ground and you're solid. I'm not going to read the whole list again. You don't need me to read things, do you really? There are a few things you wanna think about when you're planting things. What are the vegetables that you can just stick the seed in the ground and which ones should be started inside? Which, one, which ones need more of a controlled environment to get started to become little leafy plants? So, and again, this is a very controversial topic sometimes. Some people are like, oh, you're not supposed to direct seed that. This is just what I do. So. <laughs> Preferring to be direct seeded, anything that grows underground, carrots, potatoes, beets, anything that the fruit of it is underground, you want to just put that straight in the ground. You don't want to start it inside and transplant it because it will not survive. Um, other things like beans, some people start them inside and transplant them later, totally fine. I'm super lazy, so I just poked them straight in the ground and waited for them to come up. The ones that you do want to be careful with as seeds are the tomatoes, the peppers, onions, eggplants, sweet potatoes. You may notice if you do know your families, there's a lot of nightshades that like to be started and coddled and babied somewhere that you can control their temperature and their moisture and how much light they get. And then once they have a few leaves that you can harden them off and stick them outside in the garden. And then over there could go either way. A lot of vegetables. I mean, you can try if you want, um, but those, those you can just pop in the ground or start them early. One of the things with starting plants early is that you can start it when it's colder outside. Put them in as soon as it warms up. So you kind of get a head start on the stuff you start inside and then transplant outside. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Can you go back just really quick? I can't believe you did. <laughs> so there's just a little note here at the bottom about seed size. Some people get a little overwhelmed when they look at a seed packet because there's a lot of information on the back. 
Um, and it can be a little confusing. So in general, a good rule to follow when you're planting seeds is to plant them at two to three times the width as the depth. Does that make sense? So make your hole as deep as two to three times the width of the seed. And that's just a general rule to follow if you're not quite sure. Or if somebody's like, oh, here's some random seeds from my garden and they have no instructions, just follow that rule and you should be fine. Okay, now I'm ready. I could talk for hours and hours about dirt, um, <laughs> about soil. There is a way to find your soil type. Knowing what type of soil you have does go a long way. If you have a very sandy soil, you need to water more. You need to fertilize more because it doesn't hold on to those things as much. If you have a heavy clay soil, you'll need to water less but slower because it doesn't absorb the water as quickly. And there's a million things that you might want to know about just the type of soil you have sand silt clay. This is just a really brief description on how you can at home find out just in general what kind of soil you have. Put your soil in the jar, put a little bit of dish soap in there with it, fill it with water, shake the bejesus out of it, set it on a table for 24 hours, and then as the jar fills you'll be able to see like oh well it's this much sand and this much clay and you know you'll be able to see what type of soil you have. You can also just google this, it's all over the internet. If you want to give it a try at home, or what I like to do is on the next slide, uh, just send some of your soil to the extension office. Uh, it's 10 bucks. They give you a little kit. You fill it with your soil, you send it in. They not only tell you what type of soil you have, but also the pH of your soil and what nutrient levels there are. So you can get way too much information from them, which I do adore. It makes me feel smart, even though I'm like not quite sure what I'm looking at. Um, it's only about 10 bucks. There are also kits you can buy at Home Depot that tell you like some basic levels of nutrients. Cost the same amount as these that's getting it tested. I would just go ahead and get it tested because I don't really trust those kits. No, no reason. I just don't. Um, so when we talk about soil, whether you have a lot of sand, a lot of clay, if you have no nutrients, lots of nutrients, if it's compacted, if it's not, no matter what kind of soil you have, the best thing you can do for it is add organic matter. Organic matter, of course, is the stuff that breaks down, plant matter, things like that. Add compost once a year, which we will now have because of Ilm's new system. Uh, you can mulch with straw or cut up leaves or leaf mold. Um, I really like rabbit manure. I mean, I don't like rabbit manure. I like using rabbit manure. <laughs> I love rabbit manure. Uh, it is the only animal manure that you can actually apply directly to your garden without having to age it. So as soon as it comes out of the rabbit, you can put it directly in your garden and you don't have to worry about it burning up your plants. Um, and then, of course, when you have nothing planted that you want to grow for food, you should always plant something to cover it. A cover crop, clover, something from the lagoon family. Vetch is also a good one, hairy vetch, that's fun to say. Um, the next slide, I think, yeah, and some other soil practices. I mean, at the end of the day, just adopting these practices will really improve your soil. And if you have really good soil, you don't really need a lot of fertilizers or things like that. You can let the soil do the work for you. Low to no-till practices. Technically, tilling is anytime you dig deeper than six inches. So obviously, a rototiller is definitely high till. It breaks down the structure of the soil. It releases all the nutrients. You lose a lot by over tilling. So low till, you just use like a regular hoe or spade. That's considered no till. Avoid walking on your beds or parking on your beds or driving over your beds. Because the more you compact the soil, the less air and water can fit in there. And the plants will suffer. Um, and when the bed is not in use, like I said earlier, plant cover crops. I put it in there twice because it's so nice. Um, yeah. So healthy soil practices, super important. Again, like I could come and do just a whole presentation on soil and I'd be like happy in soil. Uh, so <laughs> after we've discussed seeds and soil and what types of plants you can grow and you've got your garden growing and thriving, you're gonna notice you're gonna get a lot of little insects, which is very exciting. Some are good, some are bad. Um, but there are plants that you can put in your garden that are not only edible, but can help deter the pest insects, I guess the best way to say it. Borage 
lovely flower. Tastes kind of like cucumber. Bees love it, but the tomato hornworm hates it. The asparagus beetle hates it, and the squash bug bug hates it. So if you're planting tomatoes, pop in a couple of orange plants right near them to keep those hornworms away. Same with marigolds. They have their list. Marigolds are really great for nematodes. You ever had a nematode problem? No, no one? Okay. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about, those nematodes. Uh, nasturtium, they are really good with a lot of pests, keeping them away. They're also really spicy. They're like almost horseradishy. You can eat any part of the plant. Uh, they're beautiful as well. So I love growing nasturtium. Uh, chives, again, you can eat them and you can use them. Catnip, cat can eat it, you can eat it. These bugs will not eat it, they'll stay away. Rue, beautiful again, and uh, the first cucumber beetle. So again, you got cucumbers growing, plant some rue nearby. So it's really kind of like companion planting, but this is more like a stay away bugs planting. Um, and there are many, 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 many other plants that do the same trick. So the, a good thing to learn is just what you're growing, what attacks what you're growing, and then find out which plant will deter that insect from coming and attacking. Next slide. Of course, plants can't do all the work. So sometimes you can have insects working against insects. So you can have this really gross thing here, the tomato hornworm. But what are all those white things on its back? Those are the eggs of a wasp that lays its eggs inside the worm and they hatch out of the bag and kill that hornworm. I'm sorry, I'm so delighted by this. <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, so you can plant a pollinator garden, crack lots of wasps. Then the wasps will come and lay their eggs in the tomato hornworm. If you've ever seen a tomato hornworm, they can demolish a tomato plant in minutes. They are voracious. Voracious. I got it. Uh, we got a wheel bunk down here, gnarly looking guy will stab you with his proboscis if he doesn't like you. But he will also devour cabbage worms, uh, tobacco worms, which I don't know who's growing tobacco, but FYI. Uh, we also have praying mantis. We all know and love praying mantis. M was kind enough to add the, not this guy, this is an invasive mantis, but this guy, our native mantis. Um, at the end of the day, they all do the same trick but the invasive ones are taking over the native ones. So it's really wise just to know we are insects a little bit. Uh, then you can see some eggs in the corner. Those are all different types of squash bugs, squash beetles, cucumber beetles. With eggs like that, I either just tear that piece of leaf off and get rid of it or wipe them off. Like hand removing things works well. And then in the top corner, I have the ladybug. I have all the different light stages of the ladybug. And I also have these viewers at home, I'm so sorry, you won't be able to see these little figurines. And I think it's really important for people to know what a ladybug looks like at its larval stage because they look evil and like you want to kill it. But you shouldn't because in this stage is when they eat hundreds of aphids. Aphids eat your vegetables. So you want to know the life stages of a ladybug. They look sweet and cute, but they will devour lots of insects for you. So yay for ladybugs. Um, and then the last thing on here is trap crops. Trap crops is something that you plant that you don't plan to eat, but you know those bugs are going to love. So you plant that for the bugs. And you say, hey, you just go over there and leave this alone. And that's kind of how those work. Next slide. I don't even know how many slides I have. Lots. Uh, disease control, just really quick. Disease can be a mold, a fungus, a virus. You want to ensure good airflow around your plants. You want to clean your tools when you're done, especially if you've been using them on a plant that is diseased. Tobacco products near nightshades. If you're growing tomatoes, don't go smoke a cigarette by your tomatoes. Tobacco is a nightshade and the mosaic virus can travel from the tobacco that you're using to your plant. It's amazing. So <laughs> if you ever see me shaking my fist at smokers near the garden, that's fine. That's uh, don't overwater your plants, too much moisture, cause a lot of growth, mold. And then again, the diversification, switch it up, plant a lot of different plants. Monocropping is, oh, thank you for that. Monocropping is no good. Uh, so you really want to plant a lot of different things. 
And I think this might be close to the last slide, guys. You do a great second one. Second to last, third to last. Uh, take heart. Gardening is a gamble. Like I can know all the things in the world, and yet my watermelon still didn't ripen for some reason. Uh, <laughs> there's no single way to garden. There is no correct way to garden. As long as you are having fun and hopefully getting some food, you are doing a great job. Uh, everybody kills plants. If you are not killing plants, then you are not trying hard enough. You <laughs> kill plants and then keep trying and trying and figure out what's wrong. When in doubt, talk it out, come by the garden. We are always thrilled, obviously, to yammer on about this for our Um, And if you fail, we have the co-op. So you can just come here. Yes. Okay. That's a little backup plan if your crops fail. Um, and that's pretty much, in a nutshell, <laughs> how you can have a successful garden at home. My favorite quote, give a person a fish and they eat for a day, teach a person a garden and the whole neighborhood gets tomatoes. <laughs> so I don't know who said it, but I love it. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, and I believe we are ready to start. We have a five minutes. Let's go. Yes, that's yes, our contact that's info. So if you think of a question after today, or if you're like, hey, I'm thinking about planning this, what do you think? We will tell you what we think. So go ahead and email either of us at any time. Now, now we're ready for questions. Do you want to hop up here with me, Am? You hold hands. <laughs> I know. I'm just Yes, sir. It's the back. It's about to hat. Oh yeah, we have a mic. We're passing a mic around. We're coming in hot. Is there a way to get uh, these slides? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Um, everyone who's in control of this, would we be able to send out a post with Yes. It'll be on YouTube. Oh, it'll also be on YouTube. Marvelous. We'll send up a or send out a follow-up email afterwards. Technology is one of it. Okay, it's not this cap on. <laughs> okay, so Sylvia's asked here a question. She said, I've inherited a garden with my new home. Where do I start? And how thanks, I don't know a single thing. Don't know. How to start yeah. in a garden? Inherited a garden. Inherited. So the garden's already there? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's um I think it's a yeah, it's I'm new. I just moved here, um, and there's a garden here. I know nothing. I can see it. I know nothing about a garden, um, and I was gonna take it down. And I was looking at the emails, and I saw this class. So um, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know what all this stuff is. Um, I'm, a new, I'm a New York garden pretty girl. Or like an ornamental garden for like landscaping. I, I, say say it again. It's is it an ornamental garden or like a vegetable food garden? Oh, um, I think it's supposed to be for vegetables and fruit, I think. Okay. I don't even know. Uh, it's, they started everything. Um, what I would do, um, since you're brand new. Oh, yeah, I'll quick the question. They inherited a garden. They believe it's a vegetable garden, and they want to know what to do. They don't know what they're doing. Um, I don't know what any of this stuff is that's here. I, you know, it's already planted. I, I, there's some stuff. I think it's all weeds. I really don't know. Yeah, there's some there's some pots here. My daughter was gonna was gonna do something and and it never happened. She still might. I don't know. Um, but this is, I, this is what yeah, I have. So already planted. Uh, what I would do is definitely keep it watered, especially once it starts getting hot. Uh, if you feel comfortable, they do sell irrigation systems at the store. You can put down an irrigation system to take all the guesswork out of it, or you can just go out there with your hose. Make sure you're not watering the plants. Water the ground on a oh, I like that synchronized movement we did. Uh, and also just start watching the garden. Um, because you're still learning, you might lose some stuff this year. It's already been I, 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 yeah, I don't know. And then uh, honestly, Google is always your best friend. If you're like, I don't know when this how to tell us this vegetable is right, Google it. I mean, at the end of the day, there's so much information online. It's really hard to tell you with a planted garden exactly what you should be doing except watching it watch to see what does well watch to see what fails and then start planning what you want to grow next year 
start picking out your favorite vegetables. You can even start a garden this fall if you want. Um, but since it's already planted, I would just watch it, water it, and reap all the benefits. For finding out what anything is, uh, your best bet is either identifying it like by flower or by the fruit. So when it does flower or fruit, you would be able to even just like awkwardly type something into Google using as many words that you can to describe it. Uh, there's a good chance that you will get an answer. Yeah. Or search by photo. Yeah, so you can also use yeah, Google Photos, Apple, iPhones. Now you can search just from taking a picture, uh, or you could get an app that allows you to take a picture of the plant and kind of get close to an identification there. You mentioned uh, rab um, rabbit manure. What about other kinds of manure? What are the advantages of each kind? Each kind of manure, we're going to be here a long time. Um, I mean, people often you hear people using cow manure, horse manure, uh, chicken manure. As long as the animal is not eating meat, their manure is good for your garden for the most part. The thing with that manure, though, is that it will burn your plants if you put it on there directly. So you want to pile that manure up and let it sit for a while and age. Honestly, I would say a year. Um, as, so you can still use it and it's still really great for your garden. It can get a little dense. So definitely mix in some other organic matter with it if you're going to use straight up manure. So it doesn't make things too manure. Overly manure. What uh, is your favorite um, cover crop to use? I like clover, vetch. I uh, like a winter wheat or winter peas because then you can eat the shoots in the spring. Um, you can even use radishes for a cover crop and that will help aerate the soil. And then again, you get to eat them. I, I don't know if you're sensing a theme on my favorite things. Like the things you're gonna eat, those are great. Um, yeah, those would be mine. Do you have favorite cover crops? I don't do much food gardening anymore. Uh, that was a past life for me. So a good, um, okay. Partially, it's a type of grass. Switchgrass. Switchgrass is okay too. Stabilizes everything. Anything to avoid erosion. Here's a question that didn't repeat it. Uh, can you describe briefly the new kinds of composting trays that you uh, showed briefly before? Yes. Yeah, so the question was to describe, asking if we would describe the new types of composting trays. Can we go back to that slide so we can point at things? I think we don't have a picture of uh, what we'll be using because those trays are fabulous, but we don't have access to them right now. Oh, so awesome. what we do, yeah. yeah. Uh, so what we do have is something to essentially assimilate this. We have these very large zip top bags uh, that I'm going to poke holes in, and it will be able to. I'm so sorry. Uh, we'll be able to do this essentially uh, using what we have. That's the biggest thing is that we don't want to buy anything new. Um, but we have these, I've, everybody keeps calling them Amazon bags. Were they from Amazon? I don't know. Um, that was the name that was given to me. A big Ziploc bag or zip top bag um, with hard sides. And essentially we're going to create a layered system inside of it uh, using leaf compost and straw uh, and essentially feed it with grains on top to create a very strong like inoculated culture on the top. And uh, as it gets watered down, it all is able to move throughout the system. So essentially in this video, uh, what Marco is saying is that even with your tools, every time you go to wash your tools, um, you can set it on this system and essentially as you to conserve water as well as you wash off your tools, you can allow it to move through your system, thus saving water and inoculating your system with what you were using, uh, you know, digging out in the garden. It's very cool. This compost system, however, I am like so jazzed about this. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, so essentially in the, uh, the middle of the photo here are uh, like kind of sturdy garden bed blocks is what they're called. And they have four slots on each side. Uh, you stack them on top of each other. You can like shove a nice rebar down the middle and it stabilizes them. But essentially uh, to turn this compost, all you have to do is remove the side. Uh, so it is, oh gosh slotted sides in there so you can literally just take it out one by one 
Uh, you can adjust the height of the walls very easily. Um, and when time comes to turn it, you just take out one side, push it over. Move it to the other, other compartment. You just pull it over too. Yeah, so you, you move it to the other compartment. Uh, when it is time, you put the top essentially on the bottom, um, and then the bottom ends up on the top, thus flipping that entire pile. With almost any other compost system, this is hard work. It is extremely strenuous. Uh, to turn a bin. So this also would last just about forever. Uh, you just have to replace one board at a time as they rot out because they will. If you want to use untreated wood in a compost system, treated wood in a compost system does leach ar arsenic into the system. So please do, if you are using wood in your system, use untreated wood. Um, it's worth it in the long run. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, this is some, um, I'm just I'm drooling over it. I'm really, really excited about it. Uh, and I'm really hoping that uh, with the, you know, with the resources that I have, I will hopefully be able to recreate this in the upper garden. And we will be able to use like almost all, I'm aiming for like 50 to 60% uh, less next year. We did have to buy compost this year for our uh, youth farm program. So hopefully by next year, we will have to only buy maybe 40%. So um, Polly is asking a follow-up question. Does this compost system have a name? Is it a product? Uh, I haven't found an actual name for this style. It is just a four to five bin compost system. This guy like really drags it out. If you wanna see this system in action and if you have an Instagram, the reference photo that I'm using is from a guy on Instagram. The Instagram name is my tiny urban garden or my tiny urban farm, my bad. So I do have it here. Uh, if we send out the presentation later, you'll be able to link right through it and you'll watch his fabulous little time lapse of him like scooching everything over. It's really, really cool. Thank you so much for this uh, teaching. I am a new uh, farmer myself, but I'm practicing in my country, in Nigeria. I have a, a small um, lot that I'm trying to grow up, 80% of what I eat. So I would like to visit the site to come and see this compost in action, because uh, that's one of the things that I'm trying to do, recycle everything from my kitchen to the, you know, I want to be able, my desire is to grow nutrient dense produce. Yeah. So I would like to pay a visit to downtown Green. Downtown yeah. Green yeah. is where we are. Maybe yeah. we're have a day of work with you guys. We're along. Oh, please. Yeah. Okay, well, then I'll take this time to you know promote it. I am the garden coordinator. I host garden hours every Thursday, three to six, and every Saturday, nine to twelve. During those days, it's a lot of weeding because we got a lot of catching up to do. Um, but it is literally just me working with everybody essentially one on one if it, you know, if you need it. Uh, but I talk about plants, I talk about how to care for them, I talk about what is what. So there's a lot of, well, don't pull that plant because that's a baby, you know, something that we want here. But this one right next to it is a weed. Let's get it out of here. Oh, that's my hours of work. Yeah, I would, I love to teach. I, my biggest thing is plant blindness. A lot of people can look at two either very different plants or two similar plants and not be able to tell the difference. So my goal, and especially with all of my volunteers is my goal to, to kind of end plant blindness a little bit. One of the things is I will straight up just stop garden hours and I will say, this is a Virginia creeper, this is a poison ivy, this is a wild strawberry. Like, please learn the differences. We need to know the difference because a lot of plant blindness leads to just fear, general fear of being outside and not, you know, everybody says leaves the tree, let it be, but that, that you know, unless it's a strawberry, it's a strawberry or, uh, you know, several other things. This is far off though. This is a dream. This will happen eventually. Uh, our current compost system is not functional, unfortunately. We're not able to accept any new input into it. Um, and we can hardly turn it just because of all of the green batter that's in there right now. Um, but ultimately, this is what we're working towards. And there's there's no sign up required for volunteer yeah, no. hours. Oh, please yeah, show, show up. up. <laughs> show up. <laughs> show up.
there's a brief waiver to fill out beforehand if you're going to be working with tools or if you want to just sit down and chat show up sit down and chat uh but if you hope to you know work get your hands a little bit dirty we have a little volunteer form waiver to fill out uh we can chat and learn together Okay. I have a question about ladybugs. Do you want to see my toys that I brought? First of all, <laughs> no, I, uh, I, um, yeah, ladybug yeah, yeah, larvae uh, last year, and I had guilt after I did it because I Googled it. Um, so I fall victim to that. Uh, but I have some ladybugs that were on my keys. They were probably eating aphids this year. <laughs> Uh, how, if I were to purchase ladybug larvae or whatever, would they come back next year? Or how do I get ladybugs to stay in my garden? So the best way to do that would be plant a diverse garden. If you build it, they will come. I can't really recommend buying insects online. One, because you don't know if you're getting the native insect. Okay. Um, and you don't want to introduce them. Yes, yeah, yeah. People, people do it a lot. Um, there's also an effect called the boom and bust effect, where if you release all these insects that you bought online into your garden, they go in, they eat all the insects that they can find, but then they go far away because there's nothing left for anything to eat. So it really disrupts the natural order of the ecosystem. So really, I mean, patience obviously is always required for any garden. And I saw one this year that I, one came. Yeah, so, and more will come. It's yeah. still early, it's still cold. Like. I haven't seen that many in the garden yet. There's still like I saw a couple babies like when it was warm the other week, and then everything's like, oh, cold. Wait, not yet. Yeah. This is Virginia. No. <laughs> so yeah, just be patient. They'll show up and just plant a lot of different things. And all the bugs will all the insects will come to your garden and party after sure you. they build it. Okay. Uh if you're doing a raised bed, what's a good way to get a lot of dirt? Don't. Uh, <laughs> food culture. There is a really cool way to fill a raised bed that does not include just absolutely jam packing it full of like several yards of soil. Um, there is a system called cubicle culture. It's, I believe, German. It sounds very German. It means mound culture. Yes. Um, it originated with an actual mound rather than you know pre-raised beds, uh, but it can be translated into a raised bed in which you layer quite large logs in the bottom, uh, branches on top of that, any sort of like kind of leaf litter debris, stuff like that. And then really only your top like six inches or so is going to be actual, you know, soil or any sort of planting medium. Um, it will start to break down over time, though, so you will need to add more as time goes. But that is really your best way to add good uh, soil building material as well into your raised bed without just packing it full of soil. If I could add, you could add the logs and the branches, make sure they're already decomposing and they're yes. not fresh. Not fresh. Um, and then when you're looking for the actual soil to fill it, because even with people culture, you're going to need a lot of soil yes. to fill a bed. Um, make sure you're looking for topsoil. Don't get the filter that people advertise. That's like, yeah, it's, it'll be not good at sand. Um, <laughs> so you want topsoil, and as the Google culture does break down, the lo the levels will lower in your bed, so you'll just have to top it off. And you can top it off with compost and a little bit of soil and just keep adding that in. But yeah, definitely just check for topsoil. Depending on the size of your bed, you could just go to the hardware store and get bags of it. Um, but if you're doing a lot of beds and you need a lot of soil, then you got to start calling around to there's the a ridge. really great place in Spotsylvania that's open to the public. Um, got to know somebody with a truck, though. They don't really bag it. Quail Ridge products in Spotsylvania. Um, two they mixes. Too, they right? do. Yeah, they have uh, soil really gorgeous mushroom compost. That's what we bought this year. Um, but also they will literally come up to you with a front end loader and just dump it in the back of your truck. So might need to know somebody with a truck yeah. or have a truck yourself. And it can be a little heavy. The mushroom one can get a little heavy. Yeah, so add, add, add some that. straw or some yeah. other organic matter to keep it a little lighter. Sylvia is, is saying, uh, asking that there's a consultant for everything. Um, do you have a garden consultant that you can recommend that could help her? Oh. No, I mean, 
Are you local? Right. I think local. She's talking to us. I, I, I've done garden consultations on the side. Um, so if you are interested in having me or I don't know if you're interested. I do it, but I we'll don't come. have much time. <laughs> well, Colin, yeah. They work a lot more hours than I do. Um, you can always contact me at that email, Jay Doberly, um, and we can talk about it. And if it's not something I can help you with, I can probably definitely try to find somebody to come and consult with me. But especially if it's a vegetable garden, I love to come to people's vegetable gardens to consult with them. Janet just wants to judge it. <laughs> no, I just, I just want to talk about your plants <laughs> and the incense. Thank you all so much for coming Thank out today. So Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.